Hi, South Texas. It's great to be with you again. Uh, I'd like to give you an update on the state of affairs at the South Texas Veterans Healthcare System. But I'm going to be doing this in a series of releases. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about quality. Uh, that's the current state of quality uh, across our healthcare system and what things should look like in the future. Now, as you can tell, I'm starting this video wearing my mask, and I'm doing that intentionally uh, to remind everyone that although things are looking great uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've got hospitalizations at the lowest levels we've seen in a year, and vaccinations um, uh, moving exceedingly well at this point, having vaccinated over 30,000 veterans across our healthcare system. But we're not there yet. Uh, so I encourage everyone to stay masked and stay safe. Uh, however, for the rest of the video, uh, I am going to re remove my mask just to be certain uh, that you can hear me uh, clearly. So you know, I'd like to start by uh, just thanking uh, my senior leadership team. They really have done an outstanding job responding uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, as well as ensuring our vaccination efforts uh, stay on track. So uh, you should see their uh, pictures on the screen. Uh, one addition that you may not always uh, see, Dr. Heather Briggs, our chief quality officer, and Heather's been with us for just over a year uh, in her role. Uh, I would ask also that you continue to keep uh, Mr. Adam Bernal, our assistant director for facilities, uh, in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, as we shared with you some time ago, Adam was deployed uh, to Africa and we are expecting his safe return uh, sometime between August and September of this year. Uh, so again, a, a quick overview of the healthcare system. Uh, we are still a multi-campus uh, healthcare system. Obviously, we've got our Audie Murphy campus. We have our Kerrville campus. Uh, we're still sitting at uh, 14 community-based outpatient clinics. I'll talk a bit more towards the tail end of this presentation about uh, some new sites of care uh, that we are exploring across the, across the system. Uh, we're continuing to grow. Uh, we are at 102,000 uh, unique veterans as of fiscal year 20's end. Uh, and another amazing statistic about our healthcare system is last year we surpassed the 15,000 female veteran mark. And I expect that to continue to grow uh, as we are the fastest growing market in the entire uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, operating budget, about $1.1 billion. And the employee number right now is sitting at about 4,500, but uh, thanks to human resources, that number continues to grow uh, each pay period. Uh, so let's get into a bit more of the weeds uh, as we talk about our workload and uh, what things have looked like over the past two years and what they look like going forward. Um, the slide you should be seeing on the screen is going to show you three different lines. Uh, it'll show you the national growth rate uh, over the past uh, two years. Uh, and uh, it's going to show you Vision 17, which is the vision that we're in, that growth rate uh, over the past three years. And you'll also see the South Texas Veterans Healthcare System. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is the very last column uh, that shows the two year change rate. Now, this is looking at March, in this particular case, of FY19 to March FY21. And you can see as you look down that column that South Texas continues to outpace both the nation, our region, uh, and our growth rate, uh, we're at 12.2% growth uh, over that two-year period uh, compared to the region's 4.1% and the nation's 5.3%. Uh, so we continue to have veterans choosing South Texas and choosing San Antonio uh, and, uh, as their home, and we want to do everything that we can to ensure uh, that they're well received here. Uh, the next slide you're going to see on your screen is going to show you our uh, women veterans and their growth rate uh, over that same period of time. Uh, you'll see yet again, uh, our growth rate is outpacing the nation uh, that has a 10.1% growth rate, our region, which is at 10.2%, and again, South Texas at 17.7% growth uh, in our women veterans uh, over the past two years. Now, uh, the next slide you're going to see uh, gives you um, a bit more of a drill down specifically into the South Texas Veterans Healthcare System. And I won't go through every line, uh, but again, I'll ask you to focus in on that last column. Now, the, the first line uh, of that column is going to show you a number of 34.5%. And I want to highlight that because uh, if there's one uh, thing I want you to be assured of is that funding uh, is not an issue right now for our healthcare system. Uh, you've seen, we've seen substantial growth uh, in bottom dollar uh, that's coming to us from our 
uh, from Congress and from our president uh, that's allowing us to continue uh, to grow our healthcare system successfully. Uh, we have seen a slight reduction in uh, what we call MCCF collections, which are third-party collections. Uh, there was some interruption there during uh, the COVID pandemic as we shifted more to virtual health uh, and reimbursement rates uh, for some of those encounters uh, varied. Um, we uh, have seen growth in clinical staffing. So I know the previous slide I showed you said 4,500 FTE. Uh, the reason you're gonna see a slightly lower number here is this is sp uh, specifically looking at clinical staffing, whereas the previous number I showed you was looking at all staffing. Uh, so you can see that over the last two years, we've seen a 4.2% uh, increase in total medical FTE, a 4.5% increase in uh, registered nurses, and a 9% increase in physician uh, employment. Okay, and uh, last but not least, as we look at some of our workload statistics, uh, is our purchase care. Um, and uh, what you'll notice is a substantial increase uh, in the amount of funding that both the nation, our region, and South Texas uh, has spent on care in the community. Now, I may talk a little bit more about this as we get uh, deeper into the presentation today, uh, but I'll say that some of this growth is absolutely intentional and legislatively intentional. Uh, many of you may re remember the Mission Act, uh, which did change the parameters under which VA uh, was expected to offer veterans care in the community. Uh, so some of the growth uh, comes as a result of that new legislation that gave very strict guidelines under which we were to send a veteran uh, to the community for their care. Uh, some of the uh, increases are also due to um, expansions of our home care programs. Uh, and uh, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get further into the slide deck. Uh, but some of this is due to some access challenges that I think are in our control. Uh, and again, we'll touch on that as I get further into the presentation. The information I just shared with you was a very broad brush uh, overview of the healthcare system. Now I'd like to take a step back and make uh, very clear uh, what the goals and expectations are uh, of the South Texas Veterans Healthcare System. Now our goal uh, is to ensure excellence, and we've defined that excellence in three categories. Uh, excellence in quality, excellence in safety, and excellence in experience. Now this uh, started with our high reliability journey uh, that I know many of you are actively engaged in, where we said, as a healthcare system, we wanted to be the safest that we could be. We wanted to ensure zero harm uh, to the veterans that we serve, and we wanted to provide them with an unmatched experience. And so we define True North as excellence in quality, safety, and experience uh, as a result of that journey. And so as I said today, I'm gonna be talking to you specifically about quality, and in future videos, we'll talk about uh, safety and experience. So uh, let's talk about quality. So many of you, I'm sure at this point, have heard about SAIL. Uh, SAIL stands for the Strategic Analytics for Improvement and Learning. Uh, now there's two different models of SAIL. Uh, one is what we call hospital-based SAIL, and then we have what we call CLC SAIL or CLC Compare. So the first slide that you should see on your screen uh, is a quick overview of where we currently stand in hospital-based SAIL. Right? So this is looking at quality uh, predominantly in our acute care settings, uh, and in some cases in our outpatient clinics. Uh, so what I'll say uh, uh, very briefly uh, is that as a healthcare system, both locally and nationally, we absolutely saw some disruption uh, in our sale performance during COVID as uh, focus and activities shifted to taking care of our most acutely ill and obviously having to provide care in many cases virtually or over the phone uh, versus face-to-face, -face, which was preferred. Uh, so you know, prior to COVID, on the star rating system that VA had established, we were a four out of five star facility. Now, unfortunately, uh, after sale, the, uh, excuse me, after uh, COVID, the sale star ratings were actually dropped. Uh, so I can't give you uh, a star rating as to where we stand today. Uh, what I can tell you is that prior to COVID, uh, we had one domain uh, in sale that was in the red. Uh, and as of the first quarter of FY21, we actually have three uh, domains uh, that have slipped to the red. So, uh, you know, we have some, uh, some improvement. I have all confidence uh, in our clinical teams that are working on these activities. Um, but I'll give you a, a little bit deeper of a dive uh, into what our performance looks like today uh, relative to where it was one year ago. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see a, uh, a graph on your screen that has four quadrants in it. And to try to simplify this for you, uh, this is looking at our performance in hospital-based sale as of FY21, quarter one, which is October, November, and December of this fiscal year, and evaluating that performance relative to 12 months ago, right? So the, just giving us a one-year snapshot. And it, it really gives you an idea of what's improved and, and what's, uh, what's stayed the same and what's gotten worse. 
So the easiest way to explain this graph is if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see um, uh, two quadrants. The one on the upper right-hand side says higher performing and improved metric. Uh, that will identify all those metrics that were already higher performing and have continued to improve uh, over that one-year period. In the uh, right hand, on the right-hand side on, in the lower quadrant, those are metrics that were also higher performing and remain higher performing, but may have slipped a little, but they're still considered high performing. On the left-hand side, uh, on the upper left-hand side, you have metrics that were identified as lower performing, but have made improvements. And then on the lower left-hand side, you're looking at metrics that were lower performing and appear to be continuing to deteriorate, right? So you can see we've got metrics that are spread throughout each quadrant. Uh, so um, it's really those that are in the lower left-hand side and upper left-hand side uh, that I want to ensure that we're continuing uh, to refocus on. And we've already identified some champions that are going to be looking at these uh, to ensure that we're providing them all the attention and resources that they need uh, to get the uh, healthcare system back on track. Okay, uh, so the, uh, I talked to you also about CLC sale, right? So um, just as a hospital-based sale, we've got a quality management system that looks at our nursing homes and evaluates their quality relative to uh, other community living centers across VHA. Now, I'm extremely proud to share with you that um, both of our CLCs, both here in San Antonio on the Audie Murphy campus and in Kerrville, are both currently ranked five stars, and you can see that in summary uh, on the screen. Now, the CLC sale ratings are little bit different. Uh, they use three different composites. They look at performance in an unannounced survey, uh, which uh, those surveys are done by the Long-Term Care Institute. They look at overall staffing, which is predominantly, predominantly looking at uh, nurse staffing and uh, uh, nursing hours per patient day. And then they look at quality metrics similar to a hospital-based sale. Uh, so you can see that while collectively uh, each one of our nursing homes uh, has an overall five-star rating, uh, there's a slight difference as, as you look at unannounced survey performance and some of the quality indicators uh, between the two. And, and we'll dig into that uh, slightly here in just a moment. Okay, so um, the next slide is going to show you that same uh, four quadrant grid that we used for hospital based sale. And again, looking at uh, Audie Murphy's performance today compared to one year ago, just um, extremely proud uh, of our Audie Murphy uh, CLC. Uh, you can see that uh, they've got a number of metrics that were already identified as higher performing and continue to improve over that one year period. And just a handful of metrics that are in the lower performing uh, and deteriorating zone. Uh, so we'll continue to support that team. Uh, but you can see as you look at their quality diamond uh, is also in the upper a right hand uh, portion of the graph. So this uh, gives us an indication that uh, during the last year, overall quality, although it was already considered five stars, uh, has continued to improve. Now on the next slide, uh, you'll see the same graph for Kerrville. Uh, again, the, uh, this is where you start to see some of the distinction as is indicated in their quality star rating, uh, three star versus the five star here in Audie Murphy. Uh, but again, have all confidence uh, that those teams uh, are going to focus uh, on the activities that will be required uh, to move uh, uh, that nursing home from three star uh, quality to uh, five star. Okay, uh, so um, you know the next slide that you're going to see on your screen is going to show you just a very quick overview, and I apologize, it's a lot of numbers, but I'll tell you what the take-home is here. Uh, it's really important uh, for any healthcare system to ensure that we're providing patients with the type of care they need at the level of care that they need by the type of provider that they need in the right location that they need. Uh, and as you look at our home-based care programs, uh, I'm just extremely proud uh, of the growth that we've seen over the past year, almost 40% increase uh, in the number of patients that we provided some level of home-based care to, whether that's in home-based primary care and our purchase skilled programs. Uh, these are vital uh, to the longevity of the healthcare system as we continue to look at an aging population. Programs like this give us the opportunity to provide care to veterans in the comfort of their home, which I think is reflective of the quality of care that they're going to receive. And we could do that for a longer period of time before we look at institutional-based care like nursing homes. So just a big kudos uh, to our uh, GEC and nursing staff uh, that have continued uh, to grow these programs uh, and uh, ultimately benefiting the quality of care for our veterans and I think the reputation of the South Texas Veterans Healthcare System. Okay, uh, so the next slide you're going to see is going to give you a quick overview of access. Now, you know, folks, I'm a big believer that without access, there is no quality, and I'll tell you why I say that. 
Uh, many of you at this point should have heard of a survey that we use called vSignals. Now this is a real-time survey that you know, thousands of veterans complete a month to give us feedback on our healthcare system. Do you know what the number one compliment uh, is that we receive from our veterans? The number one compliment, it's about the quality of care. Right? You can read all the, the, the comments where they're giving us kudos, whether it's in our um, uh, geriatric programs, whether it's in primary care, specialty care, behavioral health. The number one compliment that we receive is about the quality of care. But do you know what the number one concern is uh, that veterans express? It's about access, right? And so think about that. If we were able to improve the access to care uh, for our veterans, knowing that the number one compliment that they're going to give us when they gain that access is about the quality of care, imagine where we'd be uh, in um, uh, our journey to high reliability, but also in our uh, ultimate uh, experience scores, which we'll talk about in a later presentation. So um, I'll give you, you know, again, a little overview of what the numbers look like right now as we talk about access. So uh, you'll see, again, a bunch of numbers uh, on the screen. I'd like you to focus in on the middle column, which is looking at completed, uh, it says <coughs> completed, new, and then it gives you a appointment time. So this is looking at new appointments that were completed between zero and 20 days. So earlier I talked to you about the Mission Act, right? And said that that had some impact on our need to send some care to the community because of the strict requirements in, in certain categories. So if you look at mental health and primary care, uh, both of those have a Mission Act requirement that within 20 days, we provide new patients uh, access uh, to an appointment. So you can see as we um, look back at appointments that have been completed this fiscal year, we're at approximately 69% of mental health appointments, uh, uh, of new mental health appointments that we completed within 20 days, and then 60% of primary care new patient appointments that we completed within 20 days. Well, again, that's going to have implications for um, veteran perception, uh, but it's also going to have implications for the purchase care dollars uh, that we showed you uh, earlier. Uh, now, specialty care has a different requirement. That's at 28 days. So if you look at the next column over, uh, you can see uh, completed, it says appointments zero to 28 days, and you see for specialty care, which for us is gonna include medicine, all medicine subspecialties, surgery subspecialties, so it's a big conglomerate. That's gonna, uh, that shows 67.6% .6 of those appointments are being currently completed uh, within 28 days. And again, the outflow is going to be patient perception of access, and then some implications for um, our purchase care spend. Uh, and so um, I'd like to get into a bit more of the details as to um, some of the resourcing that we're going to be doing across the healthcare system that's going to help us improve this access gap that I believe is going to then have some implications for veteran perception of quality and then the actual uh, provision of quality care. So the next slide you're going to see is really busy because uh, we've got a lot going on uh, across the South Texas Veterans Healthcare System uh, to help us close some of these gaps. Uh, the largest uh, is the Northwest Healthcare Center. I know we keep talking about it. Uh, this is going to be our 205,000 square feet ambulatory care center that will be located off of 151 and Rogers Road. That project is remaining uh, on schedule. We're expecting it to open sometime between September and November of this calendar year. Uh, so we're going to be moving a number of services uh, from the current Frank Tejeda outpatient clinic to the Northwest uh, uh, Healthcare Center and continuing to expand. Uh, some of those expansions will include programs like ophthalmology, and dental, uh, some of our services that have the most significant um, uh, backlogs and access really due to just growth in population and demand for their services. So we absolutely look forward to supporting them. Uh, but it's also going to allow for some expansion of our primary care programs. Uh, uh, next, uh, you're going to hear much more about this, but you know, folks, we're, we are a, are a national leader in virtual health, right? We, we do a lot of EVC appointments. We have a lot of sharing uh, with other uh, VHA institutions uh, in the provision of virtual health. But as we continue to grow, uh, I believe there are a myriad of opportunities for us to begin to provide more of that virtual care to veterans ourselves. Uh, and so again, you'll be hearing more about this, but uh, we're going to be dubbing it the Virtual Medical Center. We're going to be reviewing some of our purchase care activity, reviewing a number of those sharing agreements, and looking for opportunities uh, for us to establish a much more robust uh, virtual medical center uh, to help us meet those needs. Uh, now, we're also going to be entering into a lot of innovative new partnerships. Uh, if you're not aware of one, uh, uh, I'm extremely proud of our surgical services. Uh, over the past year, they entered into a, a very innovative partnership with Krista Santa Rosa, uh, obviously a non-VA entity. Uh, we have VA surgeons that are currently going to Krista Santa Rosa. They're providing a number of our ambulatory uh, surgeries there, and that's given us an opportunity uh, to utilize our operating rooms for more complex procedures here. Uh, so we're going to be looking for other innovative uh, partnerships uh, in addition to ex expanding some of those that we already have in place. 
Uh, now, uh, all of these are going to be built on uh, improvements in recruitment and retention. You know, I, I will tell you, I've never been to a single healthcare system that's told me they're fully staffed. But I'll, I'll also share with you that acknowledging that we are the fastest growing healthcare system in the country, uh, we're having to get aggressive. Uh, aggressive with uh, working with human resources and trying to onboard staff faster. We're having to get more aggressive looking at salaries, uh, doing salary surveys and raising them where necessary to ensure that we're not just able to recruit, but recruit at the talent, a caliber of talent uh, that this healthcare system needs and deserves uh, to serve a deserving population. Uh, but I'd also like to talk to you about expansions uh, in some of our existing locations. So if you look at the right-hand side of the slide on your screen, you'll see a number of our clinics that are likely shaded in a red uh, tent. Each one of those locations is going to have a lot of activity over the next one to three years uh, relative uh, to, uh, to their leases. So uh, as an example, the uh, Audie Murphy uh, campus, which is, is not a lease, uh, we're going to be, um, you're going to see some new construction, our uh, auditorium. Uh, that's located on the second floor. Uh, we have plans to convert the auditorium into an expanded orthopedic clinic. Um, ortho, again, is one of our fastest growing clinics. Uh, so I look forward uh, to that expansion. Uh, and again, that should uh, start uh, here in the next year or two, uh, but that location is already earmarked. Uh, Kerrville, uh, we've got a uh, large uh, uh, renovation project happening right now on the fourth floor uh, of the Kerrville campus to expand our, our specialty clinics there. Uh, Balcones Heights, we've already had a number of outpatient clinics there, but if you aren't aware, we did open a new behavioral health uh, clinic at the Balcones Heights Mall, and we have two other expansions at Balcones Heights right now. Uh, one expansion for podiatry and another expansion uh, for women's health. Uh, we are... Um, uh, although the uh, Frank Tejeda Clinic itself, uh, we're going to be transitioning a number of those programs to the Northwest Healthcare Center, like I previously shared. We're then going to be repurposing the Frank Tejeda Outpatient Clinic, again, expanding it uh, to provide uh, additional services for our uh, women's health program. Uh, we're going to be uh, relocating our geriatric uh, medicine clinic there. And uh, we're also going to be expanding our pain clinic uh, to the Frank Tejeda Outpatient Clinic. Uh, you may see some shading on the South Bear uh, outpatient clinic. That clinic is currently 8,000 square feet and we've well outgrown it. Uh, I think we're up to our sixth pack team there. Uh, so we're actively working with engineering and our planning teams uh, to consolidate uh, South Bear and Pecan Valley. And we're looking at uh, one of our innovative partnerships that I know I've referenced to see if we can establish a new outpatient clinic likely in the realm of 20 to 25,000 square feet. And would expect to have that project completed in the next uh, two to three years. So I won't go through all the other locations, but just want to give you an idea of the myriad of activity that we have go happening across the healthcare system uh, to ensure that we're able to expand, uh, innovate, and to ensure that we can improve access to the facility and provide veterans access to the high quality care that they're already acknowledging. Okay, uh, so I've given you quite a bit today on uh, quality of care and uh, obviously a bit there on access and how it impacts uh, quality, but I, I do just want to kind of go over the bottom lines with you. We continue to see growth uh, across the healthcare system. I shared that with you in the early slides where we looked at our workload and our growth in unique patients relative to our region and relative to the country. Uh, now, I express that you know, we have an obligation, and truly it's my expectation that we're able to provide the same high quality of care to veterans after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that we did prior to. And that we're gonna do that by expanding locations and again, expanding how we provide care to our veterans going forward. Now, in the next video, uh, I'm gonna be talking to you about safety uh, and you know, how we're going to continue to focus on safety as a part of our high reliability journey and what we need from each and every one of you to make that a success. Uh, I'd ask if you have any comments or any feedback or any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to stop me if you see me in the hall. Uh, I get a number of speak to the directors each day, so I'd encourage you uh, to continue uh, to submit those. Uh, you can bring up uh, comments and questions in your service level huddles, and those will be brought to me in morning report as well. Uh, so as always, uh, South Texas, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to serve you as your medical center director. I look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks again.